OK, so welcome, everyone. This is the uh, first, or the introduction to the studies in C.S. Lewis. Uh, this is a course that I'm teaching for the first time here at Tyndale, um, and not because I haven't wanted to teach it for many years. Um, C.S. Lewis had a profound influence on me um, in ways that I, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about. But it's not because I read him early on, like most of you, I suspect. I didn't read Narnia uh, as a child. I didn't read any of his material. Um, I'm not even sure I'd heard of the Chronicles of Narnia, or maybe I had, but it didn't come onto my radar that I ought to read it. And I read as a boy, I read a fair bit. And, and would have liked it, but it just didn't, I didn't encounter it. And so my first introduction to C.S. Lewis was through his literary criticism. So as an undergraduate, um, it was a book that is not on the syllabus here, and it was while doing medieval literature. Uh, and it was the allegory of love, I believe. I think that's the name of it. Uh, and it was looking at the romance of the rose in medieval uh, literature in general and uh, presenting the thesis, which I think is probably erroneous now, but the thesis that romantic love as we know it, marital relations of love, originate in the 12th century. Uh, and that the idea of marriage historically had no such romantic connotations. They arise in the 12th century. That's the thesis of The Discarded Image. At any rate, it's a very good book. And uh, as an undergraduate, I read other books by him, including Preface to Paradise Lost and a few short essays and so forth. But I was very much interested in Lewis uh, because he was a good writer, first of all. Uh, secondly, when I read his criticism, I found that I, the books that he was writing about became uh, more accessible to me. I understood them better. I appreciated them. I didn't think he had an agenda. I didn't feel like he was trying to promote his point of view, per se. Uh, he was trying to help me be a better reader of what I was reading. And so I, I liked that about him. There seemed to be an integrity about the man. Uh, uh, by the way, I was not a Christian. So this is um, here on college back in the late 80s. And um, my professor at the time, who I will name, uh, now deceased, I believe, uh, Elizabeth Revel was her name, um, medievalist. And um, she didn't speak very clearly. She had, I don't know what it was, but her, her um, I think she, it might have been related to teeth or so forth. But she didn't speak very clearly. And, and because of that, she wasn't a very popular professor. Uh, because she wasn't charismatic in the sense that some professors just speak easily and they have a certain draw in that sense. But again, she had a quiet integrity about her. She had a good sense of humor. And uh, I, I just found that her material was rich in a way that I couldn't put, quite put my finger on, although actually I did pretty quickly. And it was the fact that uh, she had Christian convictions. So she encouraged me as an undergraduate to read um, the sci-fi trilogy, which I then didn't do. <laughs> but she encouraged me to read it, and I never forgot it. And so years later, and I mean literally a decade uh, and so forth later, I then did read it. Uh, by the way, so I, I took several of her classes, and I found them all very good. And, and I never forgot her, and she was one of the reasons. In fact, she was the reason why I applied uh, to the University of Durham back when I was living in Germany, when I wanted to go back to my studies in English literature. And I'll, I'll just, I'm not going to give a testimony here per se, but when I was in Germany, uh, I had gone there to be a medievalist. Um, so when I finished my undergrad, I was very interested in Christian stuff, the history of Christianity, how Christianity had influenced uh, everything, pretty much. And uh, it seemed to me that there was more truth to it than anything else, and an integrity there, despite the, the hiccups and the you know, clear abuses that are also there, and uh, a scar on the face of the church. Nonetheless, in general, I thought this is where truth is to be found, and I gravitated towards that. And I remembered her recommending Durham as one of the universities to consider 
if I were ever to uh, go forward for further study. And so I, d I applied there blind. I'd never been there, hadn't seen it. It wasn't, the, the internet didn't exist per se at the point. So you couldn't do a look at it online. You, you got prospectuses. If you applied to a university, they sent you a little book. And that was your introduction to the university, as it turns out. So I backtrack just a little bit. I went to Germany to study languages because at the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies here at the University of Toronto, they said I needed those in order to be a medievalist. And what did that mean? You had to know Latin. And they said you, you had to know it at, at a pretty rigorous level. <coughs> and you also needed uh, a couple of other European languages. So French I sort of had. And I needed another. So I ended up in Germany. And I ended up studying not just Latin, but Greek, which is interesting. Uh, and the reason I wanted to do that was because I'd read John Milton. And I read his treatise of education. And he talked about these things. And I felt um, I was angry that I had not received the, the education that was an education, uh, despite, you know, Huron College is is the, some of the highest standards in the country as far as, as grades. But I thought back to my education. And I thought I, w I, I was spinning my wheels for a long time, not really making progress. And those were lost years. So, um, so I went to Germany to do that. But really, in the education of all that, what I was looking for, I said I wasn't going to give a testimony, but to some degree, it's connected with my own story. Um, what was lacking there was Christ. And so when I got my translator's diploma in Germany and got my qualifications to study classical literature in Germany, past the Grecum and the Latinum and so forth, and was advancing in it, I thought, do I really want to be uh, spend my years in the fields of classical literature, medieval literature, and so forth? Is that really what it is? And it wasn't. It was more central than that. And it, it was Christ. And uh, in the end, I realized that I had to go back to English literature. So I didn't, it's, this is sort of bizarre. But I didn't find Christ in the church. I found Christ in literature, which eventually led me into a church. But it was, it was, the, it was Christ in the literature that, I, that drew me there. And so when I got to Durham, this is the I other ironic fact uh, here. I went to Durham to study, hopefully, medieval literature, Renaissance. Medieval and Renaissance, th those periods really interested me. And uh, Durham did not offer what it said it was going to offer. It, so the, the medieval professor was on sabbatical. The Renaissance literature, I think she was on, I don't know, mat leave or some sort of. And they just didn't bother el updating their syllabus. So I, I moved a, you know, across the channel, paying for my own master's degree from money I'd saved working as a translator and so forth. And none of the courses I wanted to take were on offer that year. So the earliest literature I could take was uh, uh, the early 18th century. Um, foundations of Romantic Aesthetics, which will influence what I'm going to do in my history of lit theory and so forth. So I ended up being a romanticist, which I did not want to be ever. I didn't want to do that. I was pushed that way by events, providence, happenstance. I got my uh, distinction at the university, master's. I didn't want to stay there. But they offered me full funding. And I took it up. And then that summer, having accepted the uh, funding for a doctoral and doing it in romantic literature and literary theory, that sort of thing, at that point, I met somebody in a pub happened to be female. Um, and she was a Christian. She was defending her position against a few uh, historians. And they were attacking Christianity really quite um, superficially, I thought. And I thought she defended her case. Well, I found myself on her side. And she invited me to her church. And the rest is history as far as my own uh, conversion story goes. It's not the end of the story. but. It's interesting that it was in the pub because I just today picked this up from the library, this book, The Discarded Image, which is on the syllabus. I have my own copy, but I left it in a pub about four weeks ago. It was a British pub. 
I'm not sure if Lewis would approve. He'd approve of the pub. I'm not sure if he'd approve of me leaving the discarded image. <laughs> discarding the discarded image in the pub. That was not my intent, but there you go. Uh, the horsey express needs to be called Shadow Fox, by the way. <laughs> so it is quick. It's very quick. Um, so what I found, and now, now this is years later, I'd been here teaching here for over a decade, and I found out that one of my fellow Huron graduates wrote a book called Surprised by Oxford. Have you read this book? Have you heard of the book? She cataloged an experience of coming to faith when in Oxford, so which it's, it, she's riffing on C.S. Lewis's Surprised by Joy, right? Which is his sort of conversion story. And she went there to Oxford, and again, as a PhD student like me, came to faith, Canadian, studied at Huron College. And in that, uh, that autobiography, which is a good book, by the way, I recommend it, it's, she made veiled references to the professors that we had had in common. And so when I met her, and she lives down in London now, as uh, she's spoken here before, um, I said, when you called this person, this, that's Elizabeth Revel, isn't it? Yes. And is that E.J. Devereux, the 17th century? Yes, it is. And that was fascinating. So the same Christian professors had had a quiet influence on, on us in directing us in a certain direction. Final bit of information, we both applied for a fellowship at the University of Oxford, one of the Cambridge, or one of the colleges there. She won it, and I came second. And I finally met who, I, I heard it was a Canadian, I heard it was a woman, and that was her. And so I, I'm not sure I told her that, because she might have been embarrassed, but um, uh, it was sort of interesting. Um, anyway, um, so what it says in many ways is that literature, rightly understood, is connected with Christ, and it, it leads you in a certain direction. I, I really think it does. And that's part of the image which has been discarded by the academy. And not accidentally and not incidentally, but purposefully. Uh, and when I say the academy, it's not only the academy. Uh, it is the uh, academic study of English literature. And it, it was a struggle for Lewis and his friend J.R.R. Tolkien right from the early inception, what is the discipline of English literature going to look like? Where will it begin? And what will the, its focus be? Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that when we come to the text on the course. But uh, Lewis and Tolkien were insistent that every English graduate have a foundation in the English language, Anglo-Saxon and so forth, and its roots and so forth. Uh, and they thought that uh, that gave it a a solidity, but also a, f a foundation that couldn't be co-opted by what I call in my own work on this, the human sciences. And I think that, so when I finally did come to read C.S. Lewis, by the way, so let me come back to the Lewis, it was really in the final year of my doctoral thesis. 19, uh, when would that be? 1999, 2000 thereabouts. A long time ago for you. For me, it was towards the end of my thesis. And I found when I read The Abolition of Man, which I had not read before, that he was talking about the same thing that I was talking about in my doctorate. And it's just that he put it much better, which annoyed me to no end. Because it's frustrating when you think that you've come upon the big idea and you found out actually it might be big, but it's not your idea. It's there. On the other hand, I was encouraged that if Lewis was writing it, that it probably had more um, substance than I had sometimes questioned myself it did. Actually, I didn't. I knew it was right. And I just did, couldn't get anyone else to confirm it. But I knew it was right. Uh, and then reading him was an encouragement. So this, that's why this course is interesting, important to me. Then I read his sci-fi trilogy, and I thought, this is a comment on Paradise Lost, but then it's talking about the, uh, a period in which it's not just mankind has been discarded, but the whole image of the medieval world. A and what that means is Christendom has been discarded. And the human sciences have come in, and they are reconstructing humanity in the image of the scientists, 
utopian designs. So the whole course, this is uh, the, my, my personal testimony, as it were, in the story, is the apologetic for why I've put the, cor the materials on the course that I have. So let me look at that very briefly. I'll backtrack and look at all this malarkey here. That's part of the uh, setup here. But at the outset, I look at the abolition of man. The lecture is called The Discarded Humanities. Because the abolition of man, the, uh, which will sort of bookend the course, the first chapter will form the first lecture, and the latter two will be at the end. Uh, I think the abolition of man describes uh, a lot of different aspects of Lewis's whole literary corpus, from his literary criticism to his apologetics to his fiction um, to his letter. I mean, everything. Uh, it, it all seems tied together in that endeavor, at least for me, or at least that's how I'm going to teach it on the course. So we'll begin with the abolition of man, which is actually about education. He's talking about modern education and how it has got rid of the, the chest or the heart. It's got rid, it's gutted education. And it's constructed, it's talked about value neutral education and, and the good and the true and the beautiful are just feelings that we have. Right? It's subjective. Uh, Lewis will talk about subjectivism in his work and uh, what uh, philosophers will call relativism, whether moral or cultural, he'll talk about those things. But those are also connected with the abolition of the idea of what would historically be a part of the humanities, may, namely the idea that we have a, an objective moral nature that is just as true and real as the natural order that can be studied in the sciences. So the human sciences adopt the methodology of the natural sciences and with it lose the distinctive aspect of what the humanities are, namely our moral nature, our personal nature, our individual nature, furthermore. So there's a, and so it's a direct attack or an indirect attack rather on Christianity. Uh, when people think of heresies, they think of um, questions of the doctrine of God. You know, God in his triune being, uh, God in his divine human nature. Those are fought in the early church. In the 19th century onward, this is my contention and really the, one of the main focuses of my academic work, uh, the attacks are on the one who bears his image, human, the man, mankind. And it's an implicit attack on God. It's not an, there, there are attacks explicitly on God, on the doctrine of God. Um, to this day, you get people, even ev in even evangelical institutions, denying the resurrection of Christ and so forth. So these are obvious heresies. And when they arise, people will say, oh yeah, that's obvious, you can't deny the resurrection. But the attacks on human nature and reconstructing uh, the humanities in accordance with the human sciences has largely crept into the Christian community without much awareness. This isn't a church on heresy hunting. Uh, that's not the purpose of the course. But it will be a part of the discussion of the course because I think that is actually maybe even the prime motivation. So that years ago, I, I thought to myself, if it's true, which I believe it is, that the death and resurrection of Christ and his ascension to the right hand of God means that the work of Christ is finished. It's the finished work of Christ that the church proclaims. Like, it's, it's finished. Which it means that Christ is victor over uh, his enemies and cannot be defeated. It's over. It's, it's literally over. And what is the time in the two millennia since his resurrection and ascension? These are times to evangelize and spread the good news, invite people into the kingdom that is, is here already and will one day be fully consummated in the, in the second coming. What can the devil then do if he can't undo that fatal blow? It's to go after the church. And it's to go after the creature that bears the image of God and to 
not undo the finished work, but to try and frustrate and confuse, um, to sow thorns and thistles right in the midst of even in, in the church. I think that's what's going on and in, the, and in the academy. And so I've noticed that all of the problems in my discipline of English literature and literary theory have now seeped into biblical studies and into theology. And they're adopted by academics, the same theories that were fraudulent and uh, irrelevant in English are now being taught in seminaries without any awareness because they don't do lit theory. They do church history, they do dogmatics, they do you know, biblical studies, but they don't do literary theory because it seems totally irrelevant. Except when you look at how they look at texts, it's clearly been influenced by these things, so the word itself is under attack. I'll deal with that in my other course. That's, uh, I'm doing contemporary lit theory this semester. I will talk about that in, in that form here. This is a class on Lewis. But I'll begin with this, the abolition of man. And uh, oh, I didn't book it. I threw it right at the beginning. OK. Or did I? Oh, I, I come back to it at the end, but I have you read it at the outset. OK, fine. Wasn't quite sure. I went through various permutations. But I'll spend one, the first class talking about the uh, getting rid of this moral human nature. Uh, here's a helpful way of identifying it. Philosophy up until the 18th century was divided into natural philosophy and moral philosophy. Natural philosophy is what we now call science. Moral philosophy is what we now call the humanities. But note that both of them were considered to be areas of study, of objective knowledge. And so in other words, morality, the biblical view of morality was considered to be as true and as objective and as incontrovertible as the laws of gravity. That's until the 18th century. And even it, it actually creeps into the, even into the 19th century. But at that, by that point, it's under uh, assault. And there's a transformation happening. Another indication of this same trend, in uh, the early 19th century, the University of Berlin was founded, and it was founded out with a, without a faculty of divinity for the first time. And if you consider that the medieval uh, institution of the university was founded as on, the, on the basis of theology, it's quite a shift, and it's sort of a telling shift. Um, and so rather than theology, you get religious studies, as if it were just another branch of academic endeavor. But we'll look at that in uh, the first two classes. The first class, we'll look at the, the gutting of the essential aspect of all education, which is, uh, as I say, moral philosophy. And then we'll look at, in, in the second and the third chapters, he in the second chapter, he talks about the Tao, and he's trying to demonstrate that the moral nature that he said was gutted in the first is not just a Christian thing, it's a universally acknowledged aspect of human nature. All major religions acknowledge it, and he calls it the Tao. Before going on to the third, which is, um, which is the abolition of man, in which he talks about one of the main themes of his writing, which is how, what will happen if man is abolished, what will take its place? And uh, to tip my hat or my hand at the outset, it will be transhumanism, forms of constructivism, forms of moral relativism, forms of social relativism, forms of social justice, identity politics, not that they would ever have been mentioned as such in his day. But rather than a common human nature, there will be specific human natures. There'll be a, a black human nature, and a white human nature, and a Hispanic human nature, and a gay human nature, and a, a female human nature, a, as if they could be severed from the root and exist on their own. That's what he's talking about. And they will be constructed by the humanities and by the scientists who are uh, effectively, by this point, acting as gods. So the Frankenstein scenario, which I 
play out in my course dedicated to the subject, which is um, the sci-fi and sub-creation course. That's where I really focus in on that. But, so we're not doing the sci-fi trilogy here, because I do it there. And I'm not going to focus on that one theme here because I focus on it there. I'll just mention it here. But it's in that course where I really do it. Uh, we'll then come to the discarded image. Now, the discarded image, this is the book again. It's an introduction to medieval and Renaissance literature. I recommend it on many of my courses, but I know that it's not read because there's too much reading in part um, and because my recommendations are taken as good advice rather than you should read this and you better read this. <laughs> and I know that people don't read and we will read it. I think it's really important to Lewis's whole corpus to see what he's describing here. But here he lays it out. This is one of his last books. Um, so Lewis for, I talked about how Lewis and Tolkien were trying to establish the discipline of English literature. By the way, Lewis didn't study English literature. He did greats, so he did classics, Greek and Latin literature, and philosophy. And then he began in this new branch of academic study called English. When it's not new at, at, uh, in general, it was, taught in, it was taught to women in the 19th century, just as a polite subject, but not as a serious branch of study. But it was new to Oxford University, and he was offered a position in it, and he and Lewis, he and Tolkien, rather, were, were teaching in it. And uh, I think the wars within the faculty uh, at Oxford were so strong that he was never given a chair a professor's chair at Oxford, and he eventually had to take one at Cambridge. And then the chair was one that was uh, created for him. So it's medieval and Renaissance literature, which it's not, they don't usually go together, but that was his belief that they held together. And there was an integrity, it's not, there were no differences, but there was a basic commonality there, and that was the best way to understand the two together. And the lecture that he gave there is right here. It's called De Descriptione Temporum. On describing the ages. You know, how do we determine that, you know, how, or how do we categorize? How do we fit things, the different changes that we can see in English literature? He, that's what that, so this was his inaugural lecture as Cambridge professor of uh, medieval and Renaissance literature. It's really good. And he sees the vital shift in the mid-19th century, right as a consequence of Romanticism, right as a consequence of the human sciences, I would say. That's when the vital key shift goes towards the abolition of man. That's, that's and so there's a, and, and he says that once that time comes, we are as, we have uh, uh, nothing in common with any age that's gone before it. We, we're not reverting back to paganism, in his view. Because the classical age believed in virtues. It believed in an objective moral nature. If you read Plato and Aristotle, they argue for it constantly. But our contemporaries are prone to moral relativism. How is this even possible? And it's being done within the academy. How is that even possible? Because if moral relativism, relativism is true, then there is no truth. Because more, more, our moral nature comes along with our intellectual nature. In fact, the attempt to sever the two has led to all sorts of problems, not just ethical problems, but intellectual ones. We're always involved in moral judgments in everything we do. The scientist uh, is not immune to the problems of human nature. They also believe in things, and not just subjectively. Anyway, so we'll look at that. And then once we have laid that foundation, and I think those are foundational texts, just for getting w Lewis's worldview, if you will, then we'll move on to some of his literary stuff. So the Chronicles of Narnia will do for several weeks, just three as it turns out. So I'm sorry I can't spend more time on it, but I don't want to spend the entire class. If you can't see it, you should move forward. I don't know what it is. Are you all Baptists or whatever sitting at the back of the room? It's a Presbyterian thing, maybe. Um, or maybe I need to shower more often. Um, 
But the Chronicles of Narnia will do for five weeks, five classes rather. And so I'm not going to be able to even do one uh, book per class. Um, but such is my uh, desire for the course to cover more than uh, the, what most people regard as children's literature. I think there's more to them than that. But they are accessible to children, for sure. Uh, but we will do that. And then we'll come to his book, The Great Divorce. Now, The Great Divorce is a variation on the discarded image. But it bores down to one of the key features of what has been discarded, namely uh, the fact that, the, um, that heaven is a solid and real place with, uh, and, and God himself has a substantial real nature in a way that fiction, since probably since Dante, has suggested it does not. And certainly come the human sciences, there's a suggestion that God is an idea that we strive after, but not a person who is the Pantocrator, the Lord of all history, of all things, involved in all things. Uh, Lewis is going directly after that. And so in, in The Great Divorce, he, he's presenting, a, a, not to give a spoiler alert, people die in a bus accident and they end up in heaven. And they find they don't really want to be there because it's a little too real. <laughs> it's a little too real. And uh, so we'll get into that, but that's part of the discarded image. People's views of what God is like and what heaven is like have been eroded by the propaganda against God that's come since the Enlightenment from Voltaire and so forth. The Enlightenment's an intensely anti-Christian movement. It's not just anti-clerical. It is certainly anti-clerical. We tend to be supportive of the anti-clerical. So uh, abuses of the priesthood and so forth. And they are there. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's more than anti-clerical. It is an attack on the doctrine being taught by the church. Uh, and not just the Catholic Church, but the church Catholic, historically, the, the discarded image, that idea has been uh, abandoned. So he gets into that. And then I move on to his, great, his greatest literary work. And I'll only spend two classes on it, sadly, but his greatest li literary work, Till We Have Faces. And that's on there simply, it didn't, well, it does sort of, it does fit, actually. It fits the other. He's addressing in that, to my mind, the view that is problematic in the church to this day, how the Old Testament God relates to the New Testament God. What's with all the bloody sacrifices? What's with the, like, in the Old Testament is very, like in, in Leviticus, there's very specific, very bodily um, laws being given, as if it really matters what you touch and what you don't touch and when you do and so forth and where you do and all those sorts of things is very stipulated. How does that God fit with the God of the New Testament who seems to touch the untouchable and at the cross extends grace to those who are sinners and that includes all of them. Like how, do, how do those things fit together? And so this fictive work, Till We Have Faces, is his attempt to address that and I think he does so magnificently. And he thought it was his best book. I was pleased to read that because I thought it was his best book as well. It is. It's, it's an excellent literary work. Of all his works, this is the best one uh, as a work of fiction. Uh, and then we will move on to apologetics, as it were. So we'll look at mere Christianity. Now, I know my colleague uh, Richard Davis deals with this in his course, and, and, but I suspect that my, well, I know from speaking to him that my approach is a little different, and uh, I'll probably bring to light things that he doesn't and vice versa. So I don't think, even though there's overlap, that we're really going to contradict each other much. Um, I think there'll be more of, because there's a lot there, I think we'll bring out uh, aspects of the work that uh, uh, need to be brought out. Uh, to get a full picture of what Lewis is, is trying to do. By the way, he, he and I are talking about collaborating on a book. I don't know what it'll be called, though. The Apologetics of C.S. Lewis, maybe? Something like that. And we'll look at it from different angles. 
Um, so that's the mere Christianity. And then we'll come to, and I'm s I, I, I sort of apologize, but I also don't, for the volume of material. I just think it's essential to get a full picture. So in the four loves, the anti-penultimate work there on the course, uh, it talks about the doctrine of love and how it can be misunderstood, misrepresented um, in contemporary missional churchmanship. It's all about love. What do they mean by love? I mean, love is central to Christian uh, theology. It, it's at the center of uh, Augustine's theological corpus. It's a, it's a central doctrine. Uh, Lewis's contention, I think, is that along with the abolition of man, the concept of love is also being twisted and misrepresented. And this work is trying to establish in, in a historical sense how the concept of love has certain roots and, it, and, and there's a breadth. So there's a specific uh, lexicological definition of certain types of, of love. So he'll, he'll talk about uh, storge and eros and philia and agape. These are four Greek words and talk about how they refer to, to, there's some degree of overlap, but there's also distinctive characters of that. How does that relate to the love of God? Because it's easy to confuse, uh, to say, well, I'm talking about love here, I love my pet, and when I say I love God, I'm talking about the same thing. He thinks that there's a lot more to it than that, and I think so too. So one of the things, other things, that's not on the course, but it could have been on the course, is his studies in words. He's looking at how words reflect this conceptual uh, shift of the discarded image. So words are themselves categorizing or cataloging, rather, uh, the shift of the humanities towards the human sciences and away from Christendom and towards a, an academy that is actually not only, going, not only to affirm God, is going to be directly against God. So we'll look at selections from the weight of glory, a few of the uh, essays there, all of which are quite brilliant, I think, but we'll only look at a few of them. And then we'll come back to the abolition of man, just as a review, just to reinforce what we've already done. Questions about what's on the syllabus or comments? I would have liked to have added more. You probably think I gave you more than enough. I'm assuming that you've read the um, works like the Narnia Chronicles, which is probably not a fair assumption. Some of you may have had to pick that up. But this semester, you'll be really in deep in Lewis, and I think you'll benefit greatly from him, which is not to say that I'm in agreement with him on everything, and we'll get to that, he, because he thinks of things like a medievalist. Everything com he comes at everything from the perspective of, med uh, of a medievalist. He's not um, a theologian. His theology is sometimes off to my, in my view. Um, and you may think that my theology is off, and you're welcome to think that. And I'll think that you're wrong, but of course I do. That's why I, I hold a position, because I think it, right? That's why I'm going to present it. And you're free to disagree. But then I'm also free to disagree with you. So we'll work it out. Um, but uh, so this isn't just a uh, celebration of Lewis. I will try and be critical of him uh, as I can. But in general, I think he is a, a very interesting and important figure. And uh, I understand just uh, now as a Christian for over 20 years how influential he's been on how many people, so many people have been influenced by Lewis. And, and people owe their conversion. It's part of their conversion narrative, Chuck Colson and so forth, I mean, a variety of figures. They read him mere Christianity usually and they find, oh, this is really good. And this is, he's saying something here that's profound. And I, uh, this is something necessary, let's, let's promote him. Um, what I'm adding to that, that general picture is that actually all of his work is apologetic, including his literary theory, literary criticism, 
including his fiction. It's all a form of apologetic, or to put it another way, it is a robust endorsement of Christ. Even where I think he gets it wrong, the intent is there. And he's, you know, you don't want to build your, there's no C.S. Lewis church. I shouldn't have put it out there. Somebody will come up with the idea we should do that, a C.S. Lewis church, because everyone likes C.S. Lewis. This is great. Um, but um, nonetheless, a great defender. Anyway, comments, questions about that? If not, then let me look to the um, way in which the course will be assessed, which is, believe it or not, a midterm. I say believe it or not. If you've been in my classes, it's as, this is almost unheard of. There will be a midterm rather than two essays. I just saw the size of the class and I thought, um, I don't want to read that many essays. I'm going to die because um, I take serious time with that. So we'll, we'll have a midterm and the midterm will be, when will it be? I think it's just before the reading. No. Yes, just before the reading week. So soon. <laughs> Not to make you panic at all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyone with anxiety can go. There's counseling services. and um, If you didn't have it, you're going to have it now. Uh, <laughs> soon. Ah, when you started the course. Um, and so it will largely be on Lewis's worldview. We'll, we'll barely be getting into the fiction. It will be that sort of thing. And that, so that's, I wanted to make sure that people read the foundational stuff. Because I think once you get it under, it really helps you read the Chronicles of Narnia. Like the discarded image is... You'll read it and then you'll think, now I know why he says that and why he's constructed his fictive universe like that. It, you, I think you'll find it really helpful. Um, and then there'll be a, a larger essay at the end. What is it, 2,500 words? Yeah. Which I don't know if that sounds long to you, but it's not. It'll allow you to get into it. And we'll, you'll need to read some of the secondary materials there for that. <coughs> of which there's a fair bit of good stuff out there now. And I'll, I'll talk to you more about that when the time comes. Comments or questions? Criticisms? Attacks on me personally or otherwise? It's early in the year. <laughs> no? Come on. Seriously? Jokes? I just suggested I could write my 2500 word essay and I am in You could. I'd want it in Anglo-Saxon, though. So if you're up to that, do it. Um, anything else? That's the general contours of it and why it, uh, for me, it's very personal uh, as well in the sense that uh, I just think that he's right on so many things. The other thing, the final thing that he addresses, and it's not in the fiction here, it's another area that I found for my own purposes, important. There's a writer by the name, uh, a, a Jewish German philosopher by the name of Hannah Arendt, who I write about in my own book. Um, and she's describing something that Lewis and Tolkien also lived through, which is the 20th century and its totalitarian bureaucra bureaucracy. And Lewis writes about that all the time. And that really is an outworking of the human sciences and their growth in numerous areas like psychology and anthropology and sociology. These disciplines arise and almost are considered to be uh, central because they can quantify everything, do st statistics. You can prove things through numbers, allegedly. I I've never bought this and Jonathan Swift didn't buy it in the early 18th century, but it is the way in which public policy is built. Like if you want to propose something as public policy, you have to do a study and the study has to quantify things, right? And has to put numbers on it and that's how you'll be able to make your case. This is already demonstrating the, uh, the vanquish uh, of vanquishing of the humanities and of, of moral reasoning. It's just appealing to statistics, which actually prove nothing. Um, but he, he's also talking about that there. And um, uh, that's on the margin of the course, and it's more in the other course, but it's, it's still there. Anyway, 
comments or questions? And if not, we're done for today. It's always short and sweet. First, that's actually longer than it almost ever is in my first class. So come back next time with the uh, abolition of man then, if you have no questions. And we will look at that first chapter. But if you haven't read the material going on forward, I would encourage you early on in January to read as much <laughs> as you can because at, towards the back end, you're just not going to have time. The essays pile up and so forth. So, so read ahead if you can uh, in works that you haven't read. So Narnia is, I would skip Narnia. If you've read it before, don't, don't read that right away. Read the ones you haven't read first. And they're actually quite light and enjoyable and easy. Right? Okay? Okay, so I'll, I'll see you then. <laughs>